Greetings, um, brothers and sisters in Christ um, in Kenya and uh, all around the world. I hope that you can hear me okay. It's a real honor and privilege to be able to talk with you at this very important event. I've had the privilege of being in Kenya in a number of, a number of times working with uh, Christian leaders there. I worked with uh, Dr. Takambo Adiemo when he was head of the Association of Evangelicals of Africa and Madagascar. I remember going to um, an all night prayer meeting at his church with him. I got to know Bishop David Gatari when he was Bishop of Mount Kenya East. I think that's right. So I'm just working from memory. I wrote about the way that he used to start a new uh, parish or congregation every few weeks because of the way he put together evangelism and agricultural development. And uh, I prayed for him when he became Archbishop of uh, Kenya. I read his important book on the topic um, of our conference, In Season and Out of Season, Sermons to a Nation. Thank you, everyone, for the honor of sharing this time with you. The first question that I want to focus is this important one. How can we avoid having politics divide the church? Several points. First of all, one, all Christians should seek to have Jesus Christ and biblical norms as Lord of all of their politics. It is so easy to adopt our political ideas from our family or our tribe or our race. Our central political norms must come from Jesus Christ and the scriptures. Uh, second, our oneness in Jesus Christ is, or at least certainly should be, far more important than any political disagreement with other Christians. We need to constantly remind ourselves of that basic theological truth. And three, all of us are finite, limited, not fully sanctified, still partly sinners. And therefore we need to listen carefully to people who disagree with us in politics. Maybe they'll help us see where we're making some mistakes. Four, pastors and church leaders, I think, and we can discuss this, this is not a biblical um, revelation from the Bible, but I think pastors and church leaders should not normally endorse specific politicians. I think the primary political task of church leaders is to help their people develop a biblical approach to politics. And I'll say a lot more about that in a couple minutes. And finally, pastors and church leaders should regularly, I think, structure meetings where Christians with very different political views explain to each other why they think that Jesus and the Bible leads them to their specific political conclusions. The second um, area that I wanna focus is to make a few comments on what Christians in other countries, I think can learn from American Christianity. First, some positive things and then some negative things. First, the famous American Declaration of Independence starts with the words that all persons are created equal. Christians know that, and they knew that from Genesis chapter one, that all persons are created in the image of God. And that biblical truth helped shape what is perhaps the central affirmation of the Declaration of Independence, which is the foundation of democracy. In the 19th century, evangelical Christians were very prominent leaders in the great abolitionist movement to end slavery. In the early part of the 20th century, Catholics especially supported unions, which brought much greater economic justice to millions of people. In the 1960s, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was deeply rooted, as you know, in the black church as he led the great civil rights movement that changed American history. And during the presidency of George W. Bush in the early um, 
2020s. George W. Bush and his evangelical speech writer, Michael Garrison, persuaded the American people to invest billions of dollars in what was called the PEPFAR program. And that funded life-saving AIDS drugs that saved the lives of literally millions of people in Africa and elsewhere. There's a long history of American Christians moved by their faith to work for greater justice in the world. Now, my friends, I wish that was all that needed to be said, but it's not. Uh, I also need to talk about what Christians in other countries should learn from the failures of American Christians, especially white evangelical Christians in the last five or so years. And one, white American evangelicals failed to listen to Black, Latino, and Asian American evangelicals. The whole body of Christ needs to listen to each other. And two, American Christians failed to listen to each other and to talk about their political differences on the basis of what the Bible tells us. Christian leaders with very different political views should regularly spend time together and explain to each other why they think the Bible leads to those conclusions. Three, American Christians especially, I must say, white evangelicals, allowed politicians to stir up racism and idolatrous nationalism without taking a stand against that evil. Christian leaders should be the strongest voices saying that God cares equally about everyone and that politics must treat every person, whether whatever their tribe or race, Politics must treat every person equally. Four, American Christians, especially American Catholics and evangelicals, too often adopted a one-issue politics rather than a biblically balanced agenda. A number of American Christians thought that abortion was more important than all the other issues combined. But if one wants to be biblical in one's politics, then one needs to ask, what does the Bible say that God cares about? And when you do that, it quickly becomes clear that God cares about the sanctity of human life and about racial justice, about marriage, and about justice for the poor, and also religious freedom and care for creation and so on. The National Association of Evangelicals is the largest evangelical network in the United States. And it has a unanimously approved public policy document called for the health of the nation. It's well worth reading. That document says, and I quote, faithful evangelical political engagement must have a biblically balanced agenda. Quote, again, faithful evangelical civic engagement must have a biblically balanced agenda. And the document goes on to develop eight different points, the sanctity of human life, marriage and the family, economic justice, especially for the poor, human rights, racism, peacemaking, care for creation, and religious freedom. The NAE's official public policy document is saying that one issue politics is not biblical. A biblically shaped politics must have a biblically balanced agenda. And finally, American evangelicals jumped into politics without first working out carefully how you approach politics from a deeply Christian biblical perspective. Ed Dobson was vice president for Jerry Falwell when Falwell was forming the moral majority. And Dobson said later that their approach back then was, quote, ready, fire, aim. In other words, they fired before they thought carefully. And he said that was a, a tragic mistake. I hope that Christians around the world will not make that mistake. Now, some Christians say that, um, you know, Christians should just ignore politics. It's so messy, it's so divisive. 
just do evangelism and build the church. My friends, I think that is fundamentally wrong for two reasons. One is pragmatic, the other is theological. First, the pragmatic. It is a simple fact that politics shapes the lives of literally billions of people around the world all the time. It shapes their lives for better or for worse. Think of the good that flowed from the fact that in the late 18th century, early 19th century, British evangelical politician William Wilberforce worked for 30 years to persuade the British Parliament to end the slave trade and then slavery itself. And he succeeded eventually. Think of the good that flowed from that political activity. It improved the lives of literally millions of people. Or negatively, think of the evil that flowed from the fact that in the 1930s, German Christians elected Adolf Hitler as leader of Germany. Bad politics devastates the lives of millions. Good politics improves the lives of millions. It's through politics that country after country has embraced democracy. It's through politics that more and more countries embrace religious freedom. Politics is simply too important to ignore. But I think the theological reason for political engagement is even more important. Our most basic Christian confession is that Jesus is Lord, Lord of all of life, Lord of every Christian. And that means he needs to be Lord of every part of my life, including my politics. Since politics harms or helps billions of people, the Christian who seeks to submit every corner of his or her life to Christ as Lord will certainly ask Jesus how our political engagement can help others and honor our Lord. But the big question, of course, the hard question is, how do we do that? How do we do that concretely? How can Christians develop a biblical approach to politics? And that's what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about. I think it's absolutely essential to see that every political decision has four different parts. Now, most people don't think about it carefully. They don't realize that that's the case. But in fact, those four parts are there, even though they don't think about it. And here are the four parts. One, there's a normative vision, some understanding of what justice means and who people are and so on. A normative vision is crucial. Second, you have to study the world. And third, you need a political philosophy. And then four, you need to apply that. Let me just explain each of those briefly. First of all, the normative vision or the normative framework. You simply can't make political decisions without some understanding of norms, some understanding of who people are, what justice is, what's marriage, and so on. Now, I want to get my norms, those basic values, from Jesus and the Bible. Now, second, you also need to study the world. I've never found anything in the Bible about how to deal with COVID-19 or global warming. You have to study the history, the economics, the politics, the science of the world. Now, again, most people don't do that in any kind of systematic way. They probably wouldn't even uh, understand um, if you said that was important. But in fact, they adopt ideas about those things from their family or their tribe or their race. So I want to study the world as, as carefully as I can. And then three, you need a political philosophy. Now, why a political philosophy? And what is it? Well, every time I want to make a political decision, I, I can't spend five years and go back and study all the relevant biblical material. And I can't spend five years and go back and study all the science and history and politics and so on. I have to have a handy roadmap, uh, a guide. A um, simple political philosophy helps me do that. Now, I want my political philosophy to come from, one, my normative biblical values, and two, my careful study 
of the world. And then of course, fourth and finally, I have to apply that to any political decision. One more uh, kind of preliminary point before I go on to talk about how we develop all of that. And that is, I think it's crucial that Christians first articulate and develop their political agenda and concrete proposals within the Christian community. And that they do that on the basis of Christian values and biblical norms. If we don't start within the Christian community, we're gonna end up adopting secular norms and values and their corresponding political ideologies. And the result will be a compromised often fundamentally unchristian political engagement. I think that's exactly what's happened in American politics among American Christians in the last bunch of decades. Too many Christians uncritically adopted either left-wing or right-wing politics. And the result in the US has been a sub-Christian religious right that I think correctly championed the family and the sanctity of human life but then they neglected economic justice for the poor. They uncritically endorsed American nationalism. They ignored environmental concern for God's creation. And they certainly neglected the struggle against racism. Equally sub-Christian was a religious left that I think rightly defended justice and peace and the integrity of creation, but largely forgot about the importance of the family and sexual integrity, and certainly failed to defend the most vulnerable of all, the unborn. If we want to be biblical on our politics, then we must start our thinking about politics within the Christian church. It doesn't work to start, first of all, with our tribe or our class or our race. Well. That's enough preliminary stuff. Let me sketch what I consider to be a normative biblical framework about thinking about politics. How does the Bible provide the basic norms, the basic values that should shape our political thinking? I think it does that in two ways. One way is just the biblical story. By that I mean the true story of creation and fall, redemption in Christ, and eventually Christ's return. This biblical story provides an essential framework for our thinking about politics. It tells us that the entire created order is good, precious, because it comes from the hand of a loving God. It tells us persons are created in the image of God, that we're called to a servant-like stewardship of the rest of the creator's handiwork. Tragically, we know humanity rebelled against God, and the result is selfish persons, twisted social relationships and institutions, and even a groaning disordered creation. But God wasn't willing to let us in that mess. The big creator began a long historical process to restore persons to right relationship with God and themselves. And at the center of that redeeming work is Jesus Christ, Nazarene carpenter, eternal word, models perfect humanity, atones for our sins, rises from the dead to break the power of evil. And history, as we know, is moving toward the risen Lord's return when all things will be restored to wholeness. I think that biblical story provides some very important things. It tells us important things about the nature of persons, the dignity of persons, the destiny of persons and more. So that biblical story helps provide that normative framework. The other way we get that normative framework is from what I call biblical paradigms. And by that, I simply mean summaries of what the Bible tells us about a number of topics. Let me illustrate a few of those. The first would be the special dignity and sanctity of every human being, every person and only human beings are created in the image of God. Persons are called to stewardship of the non-human creation. We're made to find fulfillment only when we're rightly related to God and neighbor and the earth and ourselves. And we're summoned in freedom to respond to God's amazing offer of salvation. We're invited to live forever 
with the risen Jesus. Every person, no matter how young or old, how weak or how strong, every person is inestimably precious. I believe we must respect the sanctity of human life Con from conception to natural death. A second part of my uh, biblical paradigm for my normative vision would be freedom of belief. Now, I know the Old Testament certainly doesn't talk about religious freedom the way we do today, but throughout biblical history and very clearly in the Old Testament, God gives persons amazing freedom to respond in obedience or rebellion, in unbelief or faith. We see that all through the Old Testament. God tells them how to live and they disobey and he calls them back and he gives them freedom to disobey again and they do. And we see this clearly stated in Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares. Somebody sows weeds after the wheat is growing and he's asked, should we tear out the weeds right now? And Jesus' interpretation of the parable says, no, let the weeds grow until the end of history. Now, the field, of course, is the world. It's not the church. Uh, and Jesus is saying differences of religious opinion need to be respected until the end of history. God gave each person freedom to accept or reject God's offer of salvation. If God gives each person that kind of freedom, then society should certainly recognize religious freedom. Or take the area of justice. There are two key biblical words for justice, two key Hebrew words, mishpat and zirakah. And those two words refer both to just courts and to just economic relationships. Just courts is very important. We must have honest witnesses, impartial justice, which is not biased for the rich and the powerful. But economic justice is also central to what the Old Testament talks about and what these two key words mean. Remember, Israel was an agricultural society. Land was the basic capital. Land was the way that you created wealth and cared for your family. Well, originally, the land was divided so that every family had its own land so they could earn their own way but the prophets tells uh, tell us that in the time of the kings powerful people seized the land of poor people and more and more poor people simply couldn't care for their families and the prophet said that god was so angry about that economic injustice that he was going to send the nations of israel and judah into captivity and it happened but in the Old Testament, in, in Leviticus 25, we have the Jubilee passage, and that tells us what God wanted. It said every 50 years, the land was supposed to go back to the original owners. You see, what that is telling us is that God wants every family and every person to have access to the productive resources so that if they act responsibly, they can be care for themselves and be dignified members of their community. Or another part of my normative vision is a special concern for the poor. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of verses that declare God's special concern for the poor and demand that God's people share that concern. One crucial measure of how God judges societies and politics is by what they do to the poorest, the weakest, the most marginalized. This special concern to strengthen the poorest, it's not a bias toward the poor. It's an equal concern for everyone. Another, uh, well, that's enough. I, I have, have more of those, but uh, let me go on to uh, my final major point. And that is I want to illustrate how I move from this normative biblical vision to a political philosophy. Now, the Bible doesn't spell out a political philosophy. Uh, that has to emerge from our normative vision and our study of the world. And I'm very aware that um, I'm sure I'm making mistakes. Uh, even when I study what the Bible says, 
and then when I try to study the world. So if you don't like my political philosophy, don't call me names. Just show me where I'm not studying the Bible carefully or where I'm not getting my economic and scientific facts right. Here are some of my political philosophy points. First of all, decentralization of power. I think there's a positive and a negative reason for decentralizing power. The positive reason is that God calls every person to exercise her creation gifts to be co a co-worker with God in shaping the history of the world. Now, if all the decisions are made by just a few tiny people, the rest of us can't exercise that creation mandate. But there's a negative reason that is at least as important. Lord Acton said a long time ago that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Sinful people in a fallen world will almost always use unchecked centralized power to benefit themselves and oppress others. In the United States today, 1% of the people own 90% of all the wealth. That's concentrated power in a big way. The second uh, area of my political philosophy is democracy. Now, I don't think the Bible uh, uh, spells out the fact that, uh, I don't think it tells us that democracy is the only political arrangement, but I do think that a concern for human rights, a concern for individual freedom, a concern to decentralize power, all point us toward a democratic political order. When you have freedom of speech and secret voting and universal suffrage, then political power is dramatically decentralized, at least in theory. And everybody has a chance to shape society. A third area of my political philosophy is what I call non-governmental institutions, non-governmental institutions. A large group of institutions in between the state and the individual further decentralize power and provide smaller contexts for human communities to flourish. These smaller communities include the family, the church, or the mosque, the media, schools, the economy, and a whole host of even smaller voluntary associations. These intermediate centers of power provide a check on government's power, and thus they're an important aspect of freedom in society. Or a fourth area, let me take the huge area of private ownership in a market economy. Now I know we need 10 years and a, a, a thousand books to really talk about that, but in just a couple minutes, let me say how I move from biblical norms to a conclusion about that. I think the history of the 20th century has shown clearly that when the state owns and controls the economy, then you've centralized economic and political power. And the result is totalitarianism. We've seen that in communist societies. Genuinely decentralized private ownership, when most of the land and the wealth and so on is privately owned, that decentralizes power. It nurtures free individuals. It serves as a counterbalance to political power. And furthermore, determining prices by supply and demand simply works better than having some central agency set all those prices. Moscow used to have a central agency where they tried to set 25 million prices every year. Nobody can know enough to do that well. Supply and demand simply works better. So I think um, a market economy with uh, largely private ownership uh, makes sense, but it's crucial to say that huge privately owned corporations can also become centers of enormous economic and also political power. In my country today, a small group of very wealthy people own hugely powerful corporations, and those corporations often own the media, and those wealthy people provide most of the funding for election campaigns. That's dangerously 
centralized economic and political power. So a concern for justice and freedom demands a continuing vigilance against all forms of centralized economic power. Another area of my political philosophy is religious freedom. I don't think the state can uh, establish religious freedom, but it certainly can respect it and it should do that. So religious freedom is absolutely crucial. I think care for creation is another important part of my political philosophy. I think it flows from a biblical worldview. We all know that we face a long-term, desperately dangerous environmental crisis, that global warming is happening very rapidly. We must aim to develop a sustainable economic order that will allow our children and grandchildren to have a livable world. Just one or two more. Uh, the role of government. I think government should both restrain evil and promote the common good. Nurturing an economic order where everyone, especially the poorest, has the resources to earn a living is a central concern of good government. Government is responsible also for providing the legal and social framework in which the other institutions in society can flourish. Government should carefully strengthen rather than replace society's intermediate institutions like the family when they fall into trouble. But promoting policies that end great economic inequality and provide genuine economic opportunity for the poorer members of society, that's a fundamental part of the proper role for government. The priority of the poor is another crucial part of my political philosophy. Poverty has many causes. We know there are people who are poor because they're unable to provide for themselves and we need to care for them responsibly. And some people are poor because they've made irresponsible decisions and they need to suffer some from that. But there are a lot of people who are poor because of accident of birth or neglect or even the oppression of others. They lack the education and they lack the capital to be self-sufficient members of society. And biblical faith demands that we empower the poor people to be able to care for themselves. Justice at least demands that every person has an equal opportunity to acquire the basic capital, and that's land in some places or money or education. Everybody should have access to the basic capital that will enable those persons to earn a decent living and be dignified members of the society. Strengthening the poor by providing that kind of opportunity should be a central concern of government. Every significant governmental decision should be judged by its impact on the poor. Two more areas. Peacemaking is the next. Jesus calls all of his disciples to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, he said. But there cannot be genuine peace without justice. When, there's in, when there is significant injustice in society, conflict inevitably breaks out and works against justice. The way to work for peace is to work for justice. One of the most exciting developments about the 20th century, especially the last 50 years, is that we've discovered that nonviolent action is very often effective in ending injustice. In India, Gandhi's nonviolent campaign won Indian independence. In the United States, Dr. King's nonviolent civil rights campaign changed American history for the better. Popular nonviolent campaigns overthrew dictators, President Marcos in the Philippines, communist dictators in Poland. A recent scholarly book pointed out and they, they studied and decided, they, they saw that nonviolent campaigns against injustice are twice as likely to succeed as violent campaigns. 
The amazing thing about Dr. King type nonviolence is that you can love your enemies and at the same time act to end their injustice. Christian peacemakers should, I think, see how much we can do by nonviolent action as a way to justice. And finally, a consistent ethic of life. Abortion involves the direct, intentional, and violent taking of human life. I think we must work to end that tragedy. Euthanasia kills persons. I think we must say no to that. But government, uh, or rather, concern for a consistent ethic of life does not end with abortion and capital punishment. Some wag made the wisecrack, wisecrack and said that it looks like some pro-life people think that human life begins at conception and ends at birth. It doesn't. A pro-life stance involves a lot of things after abortion. I mean, after uh, uh, conception. Tens of millions of people die unnecessarily every year because of starvation and malnutrition. AIDS kills millions of people every year. Racism in my country and in other places kills lots of people. Tobacco kills millions of people prematurely every year. Capital punishment kills human beings. We need to protect the sanctity of human life wherever it's threatened. A great American Catholic Cardinal said that respect for human life is a seamless garment. A consistent ethic of life opposes and seeks to reduce not only abortion and euthanasia, but also capital punishment and starvation and racism and so on. Well, my friends, uh, that is a, a somewhat brief uh, summary of how I try to develop a biblical approach to politics. As I said, I try to start with a normative biblical framework about things like justice and persons and freedom and so on. And then I try to study the world, the science and history and economics and politics. I try to study the world, world as carefully as I can. And then I put those two things together, my normative biblical vision and my study of the world. And then I try to um, apply that political philosophy to concrete decisions. Now that's the short statement. The long statement of what I have tried to suggest is in my book called Just Politics, a guide for Christian engagement. My co final comment, my good friends is this. I think that the most important political task for church leaders is to help their people develop a biblical framework for politics. And that means especially developing a normative biblical framework and then helping them see how to apply that and especially helping them see that they must embrace not one issue politics, but a biblically balanced agenda. Thank you, my friends.